So we're going to be looking at uh, biblical ethics, so we'll define that in a minute. But if you guys want to go ahead and turn as well into uh, Genesis 3, is just a starting place, we'll jump all over. Um, but I wanted to talk about this uh, as kind of an area of, um, well, a couple things. One is an area of apologetics, um, as, as, you know, kind of the narrower part of apologetics of, you know, defining good and evil, defining right and wrong, defining good and bad, um, and, and having that kind of, okay, well, where, where do we get that authority from? And we say, you know, our authority is the scriptures, which is true, but um, it's becoming uh, more of a challenge to think through ethics, and I think it's becoming even more necessary to think through ethics um, for a couple of reasons, because we're in a changing moral environment. Uh, we are, we're in a world that, as of right now, has a lot of um, freedom of choice, which is good, but it also allows for a lot of um, a lot of diversity in terms of like morality and ethics. So that can be pretty confusing, and we're not no longer really in the era where we can just say, okay, well, you know, the Bible says this, which is, is the authority, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's, you know, it's going to become more challenging to disciple people, to teach people, uh, to raise, raise children. I think it's important to have this kind of, um, be able to explain biblical ethics in a simple but, and biblical but compelling way um, as a subfield of apologetics. Um, and then for us, uh, practically, um, just kind of putting the, the application up front, um, ethics for us as, as believers and, and Bible believers is that we're seeking to become conformed to the image of Christ. So for us, ethics is a matter of um, obedience, not just philosophy, not just thinking about, okay, look, you know, if there's a, they always do this in college classes. I have a professor who's like, there's a guy on the railroad tracks over here, you know, and there's a, you know, a trolley cart, and there's five other people. Which one do you have the trolley cart, you, you know, run them, which one do you want to have them run over? Um, and the answer is both. No, just kidding. Um, but, you know, it's more, it's not just raising, you know, just complex uh, questions, but, um, you know, for those who, who teach youth group or teach uh, Awana, um, are discipling people, are raising children. Are, are talking to other people in the church, or you guys, you know, probably people who would, uh, somebody might come up to you in the church and ask, you know, I kind of know what the Bible says about this, but how do I explain this, or how do I articulate this in, you know, the workplace, or how do I, you know, where do we, uh, where do we go for that? So that's what I kind of want us to look into, and, and in my opinion, I think ethics is kind of a weak point in, um, in Protestant Theology. I think Catholics do some work on ethics, but I think it's uh, problematic because their their final authority is not the Scripture. So I think since we have that, um, we have a you know a full uh, full canon really to be able to do ethics with no pun intended, but <laughs> but that we have the you know that we have the consistent and not arbitrary basis to to judge ethics. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to say, that actually makes me think, and I have to put it on the agenda, is it would be good for us to make a, a statement of ethics um, and and build out how we, our stance on some of the things we're probably going to get into tonight. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, and this that's the purpose of this, is maybe get, you know, ongoing um, discussion and just, just thought, you know, you've got to kind of apply um, apply the Bible to this area consistently is kind of our, our goal. Um, as best as we can, we're not going to do it perfectly uh, either, but that's why we have revelation, that's why we have God's Word. So, uh, But anyway, let, uh, let me go ahead and just open us in prayer, and then we'll get into some of these things. And I have, uh, you know, fill in the blanks and verses and quotes and all sorts of things there. Um, and the reason for that is... Um, one is I think it helps you know keep some focus and, and but but also for you guys if you if you like to take these uh, things and and feel free to use them or if you want uh, the the documents of this if you want to um, teach this in some other format or you're you know discipling someone or um, you're wanting to have your con those conversation with 
you know, older children or something like that, or even younger children at a simpler level, um, I want you to be able to have these things to, to go back to and say, okay, well, what's, you know, what's the problem with, um, with non-biblical ethics and why is, why is biblical authority the only basis for um, an ethical worldview? But anyway, let me go ahead and uh, open in prayer and then we'll get into uh, Genesis 3 and kind of define, you know, define sin in terms of ethics. Just if you don't start there, then, then there's no problem. So, um, but anyway, let me uh, go ahead and pray for us. Lord God, we, we come to you and we just uh, bow our hearts before you and ask for your help, knowing that, uh, that we are not uh, the autonomous uh, definers of right and wrong. We know that, uh, that right and wrong are based off of your character and your nature, Lord, that you are uh, righteous and holy. And Lord, we know that we are also sinners, that we have sinned against you in our, our thoughts, our words, our actions, uh, in, in ways all throughout our lives, and even today, Lord, even as, uh, as believers, we have uh, attempted to uh, rule ourselves and been disobedient to you. So, Lord, we ask your forgiveness uh, for that, and we ask that you, um, you cause us to understand the importance of ethics and the importance of conforming ourselves to the, uh, to the image of Christ, Lord, in, in these things. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, this, this is not an unfamiliar passage of Scripture, but does somebody want to read either off the sheet or from your Bible, uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 5? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it. You will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, and good from evil. Okay, so we're, we're not unfamiliar with this, uh, this account of original sin um, and what the the devil is the serpent is uh, is offering to Eve and I was thinking about this earlier some people you know uh, they would hear us reading this and you know men sitting around reading about a talking snake and they're like you believe in a talking snake well it's you know it's the devil it's a talking snake but um, but you know to turn it around on the the unbeliever who's who's usually a materialist naturalist it's like well where would you think language comes from, from random chance chaos that we'd have a meaningful conversation? So yeah, that I believe in an account where a snake is using language, but you know, by the unbeliever's worldview, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a consistent basis to have meaningful conversation because if it's all random and chance chaos, you don't develop a ability to speak and communicate meaningfully. So, um, so anyway, as soon as they, they raise the objection, they really show that their, their worldview is the one that's, uh, that's inconsistent and arbitrary. Uh, but back to, in, back to ethics, notice what the, um, the serpent, what it was that he tempted Eve and, uh, and arguably Adam. It does say that he was, he was with her. We don't know exactly uh, what proximity. But he said, you will be like, like God, which they were already in the image of God, um, so being like God uh, would have been kind of a, a demotion, actually. But they, he says, you'll be like God, knowing uh, good and evil. And that's not just knowing the difference between good and evil. This is a perfect world without sin. But this is the ability to be the judge of good and evil. And then there's this first blank there um, that says, was the ability to judge or, and then the blank is determine, uh, determine good and evil independently from God. So that's what the, the serpent is offering, and that's what the problem, um, biblically, the, the kind of historical problem of ethics comes from, is that humans, in our sin, are attempting to be the one who gets to say what is good, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong, and we may decide whether we agree with God on some points or not, but we get to be the ones who get to be autonomous make our own law, we get to be the ones to decide. And so that's what Adam and Eve thought that they were getting, that they would be like God, uh, knowing, determining, judging good and evil, and that they could be independent sources of authority from God. 
Um, of course, they can't do that. They're creatures. God's commanded them. Uh, they're, they're limited. All these things. And God's goodness is what defines good, what defines uh, right and wrong. So this is humanity trying to set up a competing authority with God. Um, in order to determine ethics independent from God. Now, the world doesn't believe that, but we'll talk about the world's problem um, of ethics and and its failure in a minute. Um, But here I uh, have this quote from uh, J.I. Packer um, about the essence of sin. He writes in this book, uh, God's Words, What is the Essence of Sin? Um, And can somebody read that uh, quote for us? It's there in the notes. I can do it. Go ahead. God, refusing to allow the Creator to be God, living not for Him, but for yourself, loving and serving and pleasing yourself without reference to the Creator, trying to be as far as possible independent of Him. Yeah, so I think that's a really good um, and kind of holistic view of sin. That sin is playing God, it's trying to be as far as possible independent from God, and it's, it, you know, a lot of times people will say, and I guess this would, in a Christian world, be, be, you know, preferable by degrees, but a lot of times people will say, well, can I be good, you know, without God? Can I live a good life without God as long as I don't cheat, don't hurt people, etc.? And, you know, as a Christian, in, you know, with a biblical worldview, I would say, well, yeah, I would prefer you not to hurt people rather than hurt people. But the, the seed of the problem is still there. They're still trying to say, I want to be good and everything that I'm supposed to be, but I want to do that still independently from God. I want to do it because it's it's my way. I get to define what's right and wrong. I get to define what's good and evil. They don't live a Godward life to glorify God, which is what we will argue from the Bible is what we're created to be. So it's even if they do live, live a really good life, they're doing it as an act of rebellion against God because they're trying to be good, uh, independent of God, who is the source of, uh, of goodness. So, so that's uh, the problem with, um, with that playing God or that essence of sin. Um, let me pause here before we... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, what's interesting is, as I hear you explain it that way, is like Hebrews 5.14 talks about maturity is the ability... To discern right. between good and evil and so instead of determining your discerning so being mature in Christ is actually understanding who God is in our relationship to him and that he is the source of true knowledge right. and so the ability to understand his ways and then to use that as the criteria for determining or discerning what's right and wrong so it's it's reckoned so maturity is our our ability to not be autonomous but to be dependent Right. right, as his creation. That's interesting. Yeah, and that's a great point. I, would, uh, I was thinking about Hebrews uh, 5.14 as well. Actually, back to when um, you guys may remember when Brett preached on discernment. Um, and I think you used that verse because it uses the word discern. And, uh, <laughs> I, and that, that's not why you Basic word study. I said that's <laughs> probably why you, uh, it was included in there. But it, what, I, what struck me at the time was it doesn't, you know, discernment wasn't just about choosing that solid food is for the mature who have trained their senses to discern not just correct and incorrect but discern between good and evil um and in the greek those words are like one letter off so it means like being able to tell down to the granular level of okay what's what's right and what's wrong what's good and what's evil in a dependent way but any other like thoughts comments um Questions I wanted to pause here with this Packer quote, and kind of what we've looked at so far in Genesis, and invite your guys' uh, thoughts, feedback. You're doing good so far. Okay. <laughs> so far, sir. Like sharing? True stuff. selfishness, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that talking about saved people as well as unsaved? I think so. I think it's I think it's talking about sin. Like you're a believer, but whoever. You're still- Loving and serving. Yeah, I mean, when we sin, um, R.C. Sproul's famous quote, sin is cosmic treason, right? Now, we're saved and justified in Christ. However, that's we're still trying to play God, right? And when we sin, we're still trying to make uh, 
um, make a world where we rule and you know make our our way what determines right and wrong. So we wouldn't put it like that, but that's you know if we're honest, I think that's what. What do you guys think? Is that? What's well, uh, the huge difference is when we sin, we hate it now. We don't. We realize that we're doing all this and we don't want to anymore. So we grow. Up, so. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a you know, the Holy Spirit is in us now, and so that that um, loving, serving, pleasing ourselves comes with a it comes with the discipline of the Lord that right. that an unbeliever really doesn't have to put I, I think for us. The, the reality, the real implication of what we're doing should be all the more shocking. Yeah. Right? Because we are Christians, but when we sin, that's what we're, t the thing that we're doing or acting like. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody want to read uh, the next verse on there? Very simple, uh, but profound verse. First John 3, 4. Okay, I can read it. Okay. First John 3, 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Yeah. It's one of the m most uh, straightforward verses in the Bible, as far as I know, that defines sin is this. And notice, it's not just sin is um, doing bad things in a vacuum or like a void. Uh, it's sin is, is lawlessness in the sense that sin is violation of, uh, of God's law. It's not, not just violation of some sort of standard or some sort of like cultural thing or something that changes over time. It's that, um, that sin is lawlessness. Now every human has a conception of sin, uh, but mostly humans define sin, and we, we do too if we're not being consistent with, with Scripture, with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We define, humans define sin as things that they don't like or approve of, um, but biblically, sin is, is breaking God's law. So that's the next blank there. Sin and evil are not self-defined categories, meaning if you just say sin, it's okay. But, but what? It, it comes into, uh, it, it only has a meaning in reference to sinning against God. Now we can sin against other people too, but we're, we're also ultimately sinning against God. So it's not sin and, and uh, evil are not self-defined categories, Rather, it's pretty simple, sin is lawlessness. Um, and I just elaborate a little bit there. The lack of conformity to uh, or violation of the commands of God, uh, and that can be through rebellion, which is that uh, you've heard the words sin, transgression, and iniquity. Um, transgression is like the idea of, of rebelling, crossing the line. Um, failure which is the kind of the general category of sin, failing to meet God's standard, um, and or iniquity, which is a perversity, uh, uh, an inward uh, disposition to doing wrong, uh, to wanting and desiring uh, that which is evil. Um, so sin is defined. It's, so you see why you can't just have sin as it's just sitting there and not relative to anything else. It's relative to God. Um, that sin is defined uh, by the revealed nature and character of God, um, and that's in general. Every human being knows that, um, but especially in the scriptures, especially in God's uh, written law, especially in the, uh, the written word of God and in uh, God's revelation in Christ. Um, but everybody knows, you know, uh, everybody knows the law of God uh, internally, and we'll argue that as well. But here's the funny thing, is when you don't define sin relative to the one true God, people get to define sin themselves, and sin is therefore whatever I don't like. Well, you have millions of humans all defining their way as right, or whoever they agree with, or the majority, or the utilitarians, or the, you know, whatever, their system is right, and sin is whatever I don't like, now you have competing systems that have no, no authority. Whether it's, claim, you know, whether it's a religious claim, uh, or whether it's a um, secular claim. So, and we'll look at you know, some of those uh, examples. Okay, two more um, sets of verses here. 
Uh, can somebody read, this is these are both from David's Confession of Sin, give, give us kind of a um, just fuller idea of sin, and then we'll move on. Can somebody read uh, Psalm 31, verses 1 and 2, and then uh, Psalm 51, 4? I mean, it could be two people, like each verse, or somebody could really take like one. Okay. Psalm 32, 1. Okay. No problem. Three, two, one, two, right? Yes, please. How blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in those spirit and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Okay. Thank you. And then Brett, do you want to read? Against you, you only, primarily, not exclusively. You don't have to read first. <laughs> I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Yeah, great. So you can see in Psalm 31, verses 1 and 2, obviously the language of transgression, sin, uh, and iniquity. Um, and, both, and then in uh, Psalm 51, 4, that sin's not just against other people or against ourselves, but that exists even within the context of, uh, of sin against God. So uh, that's why David's focus when he repents is David sinned against a lot of people, but David gets down to the core of it. Ultimately, what he was really doing was, was sinning against God, and that is also reflected in sinning against, um, re- sinning against others. And then you see the repentant heart of David of that he's not excusing or extenuating himself. He's saying, you know, that God is right when he speaks, that he's justified in his, his judgment, and he's blameless when he judges. Um, and then in Psalm 32, he's, he's asking the Lord to, to not impute, don't credit this guilt to me. And he's asking the Lord to cover his sin and forgive his, his transgression. Um, so both of these verses are great um, uh, structure for, for guiding our own uh, confession and repentance when we sin, helping us think through those things and then give us uh, some of the vocabulary to, um, to repent. Um, but anyway, we'll move on to the, the next point here, looking at kind of how, uh, how biblical philosophy and ethics uh, gets into this. So uh, getting that next blank... Uh, philosophy usually deals with these three areas, so which is epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge, which is how do we, uh, how do we know what we know. The Bible deals with that too. Um, and by the way, the Bible uh, in the biblical worldview is the only consistent uh, epistemology. Otherwise, you can't have a worldview where you can really say that you know anything. Um, metaphysics, the theory of the nature of reality. What's, what's reality made up of? Um, and so every philosophy has that as well. Um, and then the third one is ethics, which is how we should live, and that's the blank there. Ethics, uh, which is a normative prescription for how to live. So normative means tells you what you should or ought to do, or should not do, ought not to do. Um, so that's what normativity um, is, is ethics deals with in philosophy, okay, how should we live? So philosophy just kind of helps break down um, these categories. Um, one of the, the so-called like problems of philosophy, and for, for other worldviews and religions it is, is the problem of, okay, is it good because God commands it, or does he command it because it's good? And so this is here in a quote from Plato. This is you know, a couple thousand years old, what's called the di- divine command theory or dilemma. It says, is it pious? Uh, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? Meaning, does God have some standard over him telling him, okay, lying is wrong, therefore, you know, and, and truth is, is better, and therefore God commands it? Or is God saying, because he tells us not to lie, um, that, that it's uh, therefore wrong to lie. Um, and it's kind of a bifurcation problem. They're kind of like, it's this or that, when it doesn't really have to be um, either one. 
Um, the biblical teaching on that is that uh, there's no external authoritative standard telling God what to do. And God doesn't say, okay, there's this greater truth, and I have to now take that because that's good and command not to lie. God's not getting a higher authority telling him uh, what to do. But on the other hand, God's not just arbitrarily commanding something, saying, okay, um, today lying's good, tomorrow lying's bad just because I say so. That it's, it's coming from the, the nature and character of God. So it's, it's neither arbitrary where God just switches it like, you know, light, dark, light, you know, has like a light switch where it's some good, bad, good, bad. It's that it's, it's flowing out of, of who God is. So therefore, when you get to something like lying, well, God's the God of truth. He's the, the God who cannot lie. He's totally self-consistent in his nature. And because he has created and is the God of truth, he commands his people to be the people of truth. Therefore, it's, it's sinful when we, when we lie. Um, it's inconsistent with God's command because it's inconsistent with God's um, nature and character. Um, and why I bring those things up, maybe we could pause here before moving to the next section. A couple of things. Um, number one, you could explain these things down to the, down to the cubby level, basically. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is breaking God's commands. You can also explain it at the very high level, you know, maybe a uh, kid comes to college and career group or comes to the high school uh, group or you're discipling someone who's, who's being asked these questions in their philosophy class. Um, but it's important not only to be able to say, okay, sin is lawlessness, but also to be able to say that we follow these things because they're rooted in the nature and character of God. God commands what he does um, not randomly, um, not arbitrarily, but he, he's the one who commands it as the creator, and because that's part of who God is and his, his attributes and his, um, his character. And so I think it's important to, to emphasize that as well. It's, it's, it is true that, okay, why is this wrong? Well, the Bible says not to lie, that's true, but we also want to go a little bit further than that and, and articulate the rationale of, well, God is the God of truth, and we're supposed to be the people of truth. Jesus is the truth. The Spirit's the spirit of truth. Therefore, we're to be the people of truth. And, and that's, you know, that's a very simple but profound and compelling conversation you can have with um, a three-year-old or with a 50-year-old. Who's, who's struggling with these, uh, with these questions. Um, but thoughts and questions from you guys or, or insights that you guys have on this or how we could uh, apply this to ourselves or in discipling others? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say I appreciated that you pointed out that um, in, you know, uh, what, I know, ask the question. I don't know which one asked it. But um, in the question that was asked, um, I, I, it was helpful that you pointed out that it's neither one or the other, because in my mind I immediately like was like thought, oh well, it's that it's pious because God commands it. Which because, is true. Which is true, but it's also an incomplete picture because yeah. what that implies, if that was the sole truth, that God could then, like you said, tomorrow, like excluding the fact that He says He's you know immutable, but like let's say if God all of a sudden said tomorrow lying is what he wants, then all of a sudden that's good, but that creates another fallacy because God commands truth out of his nature, mm -hmm. and so it it comes back to, I remember you said this one time, um, I don't know that I'd ever heard anybody say it like just d as distinctly as God cannot do anything, you know, he can't do, he can't do absolutely anything, he is limited by his nature, which is to say God cannot lie. You know, or whatever it is, and and that was like that's just a helpful thing to remember that you know, God is not that God is I'll say limited in a in a sense, but like He operates according to His nature, which is yeah. you know, truth and goodness and all of those things, and so it is both one and the other that it's like, yeah. So yeah. I appreciated you. Yeah. You know, it's helpful for me, and also helpful 
for me in the regard to like parenting. I think about when you know I discipline August, and instead of just saying you need to obey your parents because God says this is right, kind of expounding on that more and having opportunity to pour more into August's life after disciplining him, instead of just kind of using that because that is true, but also the other side, the flip side of that is it's true because that's it, that's his nature. Um, so yeah, it's, it's helpful, it's super helpful. And one of the things that I think that does is gives you the basis to say that, essentially that God knows best for us, right? Mm -hmm. Being our creator, God knows that truth is best for us. Um, it's one of the you know, effects of him creating us and you know, um, doing all those things according to his nature. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember being just, that was that rocked me one time when that, when I learned that that um, right and wrong it, it's or what is right is just an extension of his nature right it's defined by who he is in his character and then conversely he can the reason why he cannot sin is because what is right is based on his nature anything opposite that is the sin right. Yeah, and it's it's key to yeah understand that um, that because God, I love Titus one too. God who cannot lie. And Kenton knows he's been there a lot of times when I've asked the kids in Awana or you know or Sunday school. I love asking them, is there anything God cannot do? And they're like, no, no. And then <laughs> I'm like, okay, I get, appreciate where you're coming from. However, and then you talk about a few verses where it's God cannot do these things, not because of an in, you know. Uh, deficiency or a weakness on God's part or his power it's that God is, is consistent with his his own nature um, and it's because of that consistency not only do we know um, ethics because his consistency can also tie into um, not just what is but this is required of, of us we're accountable to this as human beings um, and especially as believers who have been redeemed in Christ but also, it's God is the only reference point for, for truth. Um, so when people, unbelievers, make true statements, they're borrowing from, from the God that they're denying, who's the reference point of, of truth, and is the only way that they can know any truth whatsoever. So when they say, well, I don't know God, I don't believe in God, it, it's not that they're, you know, I'm sure they're, they're being authentic in that statement, in that sense. But the truth is that they do know God because they're using God's, uh, God's truth based on his nature, even when they deny him. And so it, it's an inescapable um, situation. And we were all there as well. We're only um, recognizing these things because the, the Holy Spirit changed our hearts to believe in Christ and accept God's revelation savingly. Um, but... But that's the human condition, is, is using, um, trying to use God's truth to argue against, uh, argue against God and become autonomous and then say, oh, well, I didn't know. God didn't tell me. Um, but in doing that, they, they perform that they do know. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I was thinking about uh, the image of God today and, and how you know, just the function of um, engaging in a conversation about ethics is an indication that you know that that's an indication of the of the creatures um, of, the, of the image of God in the creature yeah. that he has this moral component but he's aware that there's a right and wrong and he and he seeks to you know order his life and world in terms of you know those principles of what is right and wrong again, like you say, with a naturalist sort of a of a of a um, worldview, right? You are you have you have no way to account for the moral component in you know in humans. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll see that in you know the what I call the failure of non-biblical ethics. There is no ethical system, religious or secular. Um, outside of the biblical worldview that can that is consistent, meaning it, it connects with itself consistently, it doesn't contradict itself, um, and that is non-arbitrary. So you can have ones that are consistent, 
but then they, they ultimately come down to because I said so, mm -hmm. in some level. And, and that's basically um, all that it is. And people make fun of us when we say, well, because God says so. It's like, well, <laughs> the alternative is, is you say so, or the group says so, or society says so, or whoever else. Um, but it's arbitrary. Um, our standard is not. Our ultimate authority is, is God and Christ uh, revealed in the scriptures. Our standard's not arbitrary because God is the creator. So what he says is, is it for, for this world and for us as his creatures. So, um, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, just kind of some uh, wording there on ethics and morality. Um, ethics and morality, these are related concepts. Uh, and this is hopefully you know, the one contribution I make to the, the church. Is, is making sure people know there's a distinction between these. No, I'm just kind of kidding. But, uh, but there is a distinction. Um, and people usually use morality, um, the word morality, which is okay. Um, it's, I, we know what people are meaning, so you don't want to be uh, uh, too picky over this. But morality is connected with the Latin word uh, mores, um, which is like an overall kind of like how a group uh, kind of reacts to it. So morality in this sense is is changing. It is it is relative. It does change over time in that uh, that sense. And it's it has to do with non ethical matters. It could be connected to ethics. So it's something like driving on the right side of the road in America. Um, that's a mores. Um, now we could do that for a good reason, but when you go to Britain or somewhere and they drive on the left they're they're not behaving in a way that's unethical. It's just a different, you know, different mores based on their culture. It is wrong, but no. <laughs> um, so so these things would be like uh, you know how people dress or stuff like that to, to a certain extent, or like um, putting the fork on the left or stuff like that. Um, and then it can it can extend to stuff where it's like they're a little closer to like dealing with something more more ethically significant. Ethics, on the other hand, is it's not mutable, it's not changing, um, it's, it doesn't change acceptance uh, based on some idea uh, or behavior. So ethics are a standard of right and wrong, good and evil, to which people can be called to uh, regardless of time, region, culture, geographical, region, moral system. So it's wrong to uh, murder, it's wrong to kidnap someone. I don't care you know, what their culture is uh, or what their mores are, you can declare that to be, be wrong no matter where you go. Okay, so that's ethics. Morals or mores are a little bit different. Like it's not wrong to um, have a church that doesn't have air conditioning like brothers and sisters in Africa. That's like something that we're used to, or it's not wrong to, you, you guys see what I'm saying of the kind of the distinction there? Um, there are, like, I think about things like uh, changing views of morality with reference to the law, that there were things, you know, that were, that were deemed immoral legally, you know, in the 20s and 30s and 40s in the United States of America, but those mores have changed because thinking about those issues has changed. And right. so there's a sense in which, you know, even in American law or in American culture, morals, as we think about them in terms of the, you know, our country's standards of what is okay and what is not okay with those things, uh, you know, are changing by virtue of, you know, the fact that right. they are morals and not ethics, I guess. And I'll give you guys an example that they kind of, where they kind of overlap. Uh, like drunk driving. That's ethically wrong. For, you know, you can, you can kill someone, damage their property, hurt yourself. That is a, a sin as well as a crime. Uh, and rightfully so, but there was a moral change um, that took place with regard to drunk driving. Like back when you watch the Andy Griffith show, you know, who was the guy who was drunk on the tractor? Was it Gomer Otis. or something? Otis. Okay, Otis, yeah. it was like kind of funny. Like the guys would just you'd go drink and then you'd just drive around on his <laughs> tractor, and that was, uh, and then you'd go to church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that was like a a cultural mores thing that like in the 70s and 80s. Mothers Against Drunk Driving came around and there was a, a kind of a cultural shift where 
if somebody tries to like drink now and like leave a party or a bar, there's now a moral shift where people are like, dude, that's not okay. You know? And, um, so that's a, that's like a good moral shift. There can be bad ones as well. Um, and, but, so that's related to ethics, but it's the mores have changed. The ethics of that situation have not. Um, or there could be things like, uh, like the mores around um, like interracial marriage or something. Those have changed over time. Um, the, the ethics regarding marriage have not changed, but the mores of, okay, well, you know, people of different races can't marry each other, that has changed. So, and that's not to say, oh, well, the ethics, you know, it's still wrong to marry someone of a different right. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. So, uh, well, Would you say, um, on that note, that, like, for a believer, with, like, I guess, like, should the morals of a believer be unchanging, more or less? Because, or, or would you say if it gets into something that's like that, that we wouldn't define it as a moral anymore and just be more of ethics? Because I, I, think I think about things like, I mean, like the interracial marriage thing. Like, for a believer, that should never have been. I, now I know, I understand culturally, right. yes, that did change, but like, I think, you know, morally we would say that, you know, for believers, that should never be, should never have been really an issue. Right. Um, is it the kind of thing where we would like define, I don't know. Well, let's say that maybe it should only change in growth into maturity, Christ likeness, <laughs> sure. not, but you know, but it's, it's sometimes we're not, um, we're not always consciously aware of like our sure. mores. So it's like something like fork on the left is not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. um, so like, why should that matter? We have mores, we don't escape them, but it's, uh, my point is just that, that they're distinguished um, terms. Sure. So like ethics, okay, what's, ethics are the authoritative, this is a standard we call people to no matter what, but we have to be careful sometimes to define the mores, but yeah, I, I Cause, Yeah, because I think like up to this point, I would have defined what are actually ethics, yeah. I would have called those morals, mm -hmm. and then those other things I would have called maybe customs or something like that, yeah. right? And, and, I, on and, the left, right side of the room. Yeah, you have a point yeah. as well, like there are things that, people uh, have morals about that, that are, that are good. Um, it's just, you know, that it's, uh, it's important to make sure we're basing those off of, um, I guess, an ethical standard. But there, there are things that change all the time, you know, that, it, it, like I said, there's kind of a, uh, a spectrum of, you know, driving on the left side of the road um, in another country is different than uh, you know, people thinking one way or another about drunk driving. So I understand that. I, but but anyway, it's just the point is just the distinguishing between the the words. So, sure. um, but again, not to get too picky over this. Uh, Brett, did you want to add something or were you? Oh, I thought you were here. You got kind of like looking like you were about to say something a minute ago. So I was just making sure. Okay. Um, all right. And obviously, again, this is a. A complex and sinful world, and you guys know I'm not a moral relativist in any way, but but we have to think pretty carefully with regard to a, a complex network of, of issues, which is why we need biblical wisdom as well. So the, the Bible provides a lot of, like there's the law, but then there's also like the exposition of the law in the Psalms and the Proverbs that give wisdom and skill in applying those things. So um, so we're, we don't perfectly apply these things uh, either, but that doesn't mean the standard is not there. Okay, uh, let's talk about ethics and authority, or what I call the, the failure of, uh, of non-biblical ethics. And then we'll look at a couple of uh, examples. Um, okay, so here's, here's the statement here. Other worldviews make ethical claims. They say this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. This is evil. This is good, um, but they cannot sustain them consistently. They cannot be consistent. Not just that they are against the Bible. Um, my contention here is that other ethical systems are self-defeating. That they are not even consistent when you apply their own standard to themselves. They collapse, and that's why I say there's there's no alternative 
to the biblical worldview based on God's revelation. Because what you come down to, it's just like, uh, it's just like knowledge. With ethics, what you come down to is an alternative of basically, we're in an impersonal universe of chance chaos, which, there's, which you already mentioned, there's no basis for ethics in that. It's, we're just stuff in space. We're just chemical and physical reactions. We may not, things may be unpleasant, but they're not evil. They're not good. It's just what is. Or it's human thought, which means it's ba on the basis of opinion. And that's what we're going to get into here is that you, that is arbitrary. There is no authority behind one person's opinion over another person's opinion. Um, or it's God's revelation. And so it's only God's revelation that saves ethics, that saves reason, that saves science, that, that allows us to humans to engage in those things whatsoever. So even when unbelievers in, talk about ethics and they say, you know, despite what they say their worldview is, yeah, I don't believe, you know, I'm, I'm a naturalist, I'm a materialist, I just think physical matter is all that there is. But then they'll say that something's wrong. They're betraying their own worldview and showing that they don't really believe that that's the case. Um, and we should be thankful when they do that because we show, okay, we, wait a second, you think we're all the product of material and natural forces, and yet you're saying that this is wrong, how could you make that statement if your worldview was true? You can make that statement if the Bible is true, and God is the standard of right and wrong, and you know it, and we all know it, but you can't make that statement if, uh, if your worldview is true. So either your worldview is false, or your ethical claim is false, but you, you can't have it both ways. As soon as you let go of one you, to grab the other, you, you lose. And so this is what um, non-biblical ethics amounts to. Now, you could say, uh, I'm not going to deal with this tonight, but you could say, like, okay, well, couldn't Mormons, Muslims, Catholics say the same thing? Um, and the answer is no, because they don't really have a doctrine of uh, God's revelation, the, the Mormon God is changing, which means a changing standard of truth or an independent standard of truth. Um, the God of, of Islam, even though it's claimed to be the God of the Bible, uh, there are passages in, the not the Quran, but the shuras that say that he cannot be communicated in human language. Therefore, he can't be known. There's no revelation there. Or the, the even the Catholic Church, okay, well, they claim the Bible too, but they also add in man's authority and for about seven eight hundred years have said have basically argued that there's this independent space of man's kind of neutral reason to judge between good and evil and choose good and the problem is when you do that you really make man the ultimate authority and that was a big problem obviously in the, the revelation uh, in the revelation in uh, the reformation is they said well, wait a second, we have all these competing authorities, and they had, you know, a hundred years before the Reformation, you had three popes and a council deciding which of the popes was legitimate. And so when you have that, you have a question of, okay, which, which is more authoritative, the popes or the council? Well, whichever one makes the declaration, it's still located in man's authority. So that's why, you know, Catholics sometimes make fun of our sola scriptura thing. But it was a historical necessity where they said, none of this can be consistent. We have to go back to the Bible as the only authority because what's, all the, what's the alternative? It's either competing authorities among men or God's word. And so that's what, you know, that's, so that's the... That's the historical argument for Sola Scriptura, is that it wasn't they just woke up one day and said, hey, we're just going to believe the Bible and ignore all of previous church history. What they said was, we have a big authority crisis here, and everybody's claiming to have authority and speak for God. Well, where's the one place we know God has spoken? In the Scriptures. And so that was, uh, that was their argument for Sola Scriptura, so it's actually pretty... Uh, pretty sophisticated. Mm -hmm. It's not just saying, oh, we just believe the Bible and ignore everything else. It's, we, the Bible is the only authority. It's the only option. So, um, okay. So, a uh, couple blanks here to write down. 
um, the contemplation of ethics, okay, here, uh, here's the, what it comes down to. If you can explain this, you can basically have the, the apologetic uh, shotgun to, to deal with any ethical system that's non-biblical, whether it's secular or religious. Uh, it comes with an internal dilemma. Here it is. It's pretty simple. Humans have potential for error, so that's the first blank, and corruption. Humans have the potential for error and corruption. We know that in ourselves. Error is the idea that we make uh, mistakes even without knowing it sometimes. Like, you know, it's, um, I always used to comfort when I make a mistake at work and like uh, enter in like the wrong grade into the grade book and a student would say, hey, this isn't matching up. And he would come over and bring it to me. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me correct that. And then they would still be kind of like upset about it after they're like, well, I, I just really, you know, wish you didn't put it in there. I'm like, yeah, join the club. I wish I didn't either. But I said, but at least we found it, right? You know, so the, the real problem is when we, I make a mistake and, you know, or we make a mistake and it just doesn't get noticed, right? So this is why I'm not a heart surgeon. <laughs> you know, I put, put the wrong grade. It's a problem, but nobody dies. Uh, so... But here, so we, we recognize, we make mistakes, errors in our judgment, errors in our ethical thinking. Um, but it's not just that we, we don't have perfect information or that we're ignorant. It's that we also know that we and others have a tendency toward corruption, meaning that we are biased in regard to ourselves. We can be selfish. Uh, we can do what's wrong. We can want what's wrong. We can want what's evil. And we, can, we know other human beings have that problem, too. And I don't think anybody would really, um, unbelievers or anybody else, would really deny this. This is the conversation I have, like, day one in my government classes, when we talk about, you know, government, what it is, and stuff like this. This is, you know, what it comes down to. They're like, well, I know, you know, there are other people. To what extent can you trust other people is, is a question. Um, so here's, here's the biggest problem with all ethical systems is they recognize the need for external accountability. They recognize humans can make mistakes and that they can be corrupt. They can do things that are bad. Mm -hmm. But what's the alternative? Well, that external accountability has to come from other human beings. So basically, this is what we've got. We've got fallible and corrupt humans making rules for other fallible and corrupt humans. It's arbitrary. It's, it's based on opinion or force or majority vote or whatever the case is, but it, it's, not, um, it's not justified. And so um, this is why it's, it's funny when I talk about this with, with regard to government, they say, okay, well, People are, are bad, and they talk about, yeah, you know, my students will say, yeah, people, I don't trust them, I don't trust my own neighbor, I don't even trust, I ask them, I'm like, don't say this out loud, but do you trust the people in this class? Like, there's like 30 of us in there, and they're like, no, I don't trust anybody, and uh, even myself, or, you know, we, we make this, and they're, they're right, but their solution to that is other, rule by other people, and I say, okay, now you see, we've got a problem here now, because the only the system has to be self-regulated by humans. So now we've got to think through this carefully. So here's, here's the problem. Um, ethics recognize the need for external accountability for fallible and corrupt humans, yet uh, any accountability must be self-regulated and or enforced by other fallible, corrupt humans. And so therefore, every ethical system based on human thought or judgment has to fail because it bases itself on ultimately on human authority in order to establish human authority and therefore it's arbitrary. It has, it has no right, no basis to, to make those claims over, uh, over other people. Um, and that's because uh, all ethical systems depend on the autonomous uh, moral consciousness of men. They, if you reject God's revelation, then you have thrown out, uh, you've undermined the whole basis of ethics. Now, now it's up to either impersonal environment of chance chaos, or it's up to human opinion in whatever mix that you want to do that in. 
and uh, ethics comes down to preference or it comes down to uh, enough people you can get on your side for, for power, right? So, so yeah, go ahead. So I uh, was thinking about this related to uh, you know American government and our constitution and thinking about three branches of you know, three branches of government all designed to sort of hold one another in check. If you think of, I think about that, I'm going, well, like, that seems like, a, you know, a genuine attempt on the part of the founders to go, okay, it's messed up just from, you know, principally it's messed up, but yet at the same time, we at least try to put together some source of accountability, you know, that holds other branches of government in check for their you know, use or wielding of power. Yeah. I thought much about that, but... I'm yeah, and they did believe still, that, but they ran into the same problem. They still located authority in, uh, in other, you know, human except, beings. Right, so. except for the fact that they tried to, they tried to keep, they tried to create their Bible of, you know, government of law, which is, you right. know, and our they constitution. Had to, had to have a system that they could change. Because <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, this is going to... Yeah, work. so... Um, so anyway, yeah, I remember writing this stuff down, and, and uh, I was in ethics and media class, and they're like, write a paper on your view of ethics. And so what I did, I was sitting down, I think it was actually on like right before we went over to like Fourth of July at the Moors in twenty twenty. This is class for my master's degree, and I'm like, let me explain why ethics is like in total is totally internally inconsistent, no matter what you do. <laughs> so, so I started off with that, and uh, and kind of walked through some examples, uh, but. But I was serious about it. I'm like, well, if you if you really apply it consistently to itself, without God's revelation, you're you're done. You're stuck. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> other human beings, they try to you know uh, build a Rube Goldberg machine around it. You know, it's it's one of those machines that have the stuff that's fallen down like mouse trap, and uh, to try to avoid that. But they're just trying to establish some type of ethics uh, without God. Uh, but in doing, in engaging in that thought, Romans two says that there, it's the God's law written on their heart, uh, either alternatively accusing or defending them. Um, so that by engaging in that process, they're showing that they they know God, they're rejecting His law, but they're trying to establish their own authority um, as an alternative. Um, I think it's. Interesting, like when we talk about you know, systems, what's the perfect system of government? It's a monarchy with Jesus, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. It's like the yeah. best, the best yeah. kind of yeah. government. Yeah. Millennial theocracy. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. So okay. I mean, got more here, but these are, these are things that you guys could look at. I mean, we're we're coming to nine o'clock here, so. Um, I told Brett in kind of a joking way, I'm like, oh, I'll finish this up next time, but maybe we'll continue this at another time. But just, I'll just give you guys some quick examples. Um, I would encourage you to peruse this, the rest of this on your own if you like. Um, it, it gives you some more examples. So for example, there's like empiricism that, oh, we just judge good and evil by looking and observing what is, you know. But the problem with that is you can judge what is all you want, but you don't get any should or shouldn't out of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that suffering over there is happening, is unpleasant, but you can't say that should not happen. Exactly. That, you know, that, uh, oh, Brett's trying to get the answer. I'll send you guys this stuff if you want, uh, the, yeah, you know, great. my version of that. Thanks, well. Thank okay. you very much. I'm Take care, uh, yeah. okay. I'm done. I'm like about to expire. I'm turning something okay. okay. I got. I got to. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. I yeah, really thanks. hope that you come back to this again. It's very just cool. mine. Just oh, mine. thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, See, uh, bad. Bad. Um, I should follow his example. You should. I'm just kidding. All right, I'll I'll finish up with just a couple more of these. And uh, so neutrality. That's another one. People say, okay, well, let's let's just abandon our. They may not say it this way. Let's just try to join on neutral ground, and then we'll judge for ourselves what's correct or not correct. You know, when you're talking with someone about the gospel or whatever. Problem with neutrality is that it's self-defeating. Because if you step off your position or they step off theirs into neutrality, 
what you're implicitly admitting is that your position, original position is wrong, neutrality is correct. So we should both try to be neutral. That's the right position. But if you say, no, 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 neutrality is not right, but I'm trying to argue my position is right from being neutral, you're saying neutrality is wrong. So either one, it becomes a self-defeating thing. I drew a little diagram there that either you have to give up your position to be neutral, which means my position is wrong, or you have to give up neutrality to hold on to your position, which means neutrality is wrong. So God doesn't allow us to be neutral. You know, he calls us to, uh, he commands us, he calls us, uh, Jesus talks about, you know, he's, he's not with me, he's against me. There's, it, the Bible is not neutral. God's not neutral in his ethics, and he doesn't say, hey, you on your own, independently and neutrally, you decide whether I'm right and wrong, and then you bow down at the, you know, you use that ladder to climb up and then bow down to Jesus as Lord and throw away the ladder. That's not how it works. Um, and then I'll just, yeah, relativism is an easy one. Um, I think one of the tricky ones is, uh, is idealism, which is, is people believe in absolutes, but they are not basing those off of uh, God's revelation in Scripture and the God of the Bible. So this is my bone to pick with, this is like other religions who do this, um, and this is my bone to pick even with um, kind of like the broadly Christian um, attempt to do this, uh, even with like popular authors like C.S. Lewis, who would try to, they're like, well, I recognize the absolute in the Tao in Buddhism, and in Plato's good, and in this, and we all recognize there's this absolute. The problem with doing that is that all these judgments of the absolute, they're just, they're just saying there's some abs, uh, kind of undefined absolute standard of what is good and what is true, but it, that's not the same as saying what that standard is or saying that that's defined by the nature and character of the God who's the creator and who's revealed himself in Christ in scripture. So the problem when you've done that is you, you've allowed people to be, to be vague about what the absolute is or just some, you know, kind of uh, the, the unmoved mover, the, the first cause. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the heavens are telling of the glory of God, not just some uncaused first cause, you know, energy type of thing. Um, and, and when it comes down to it, the, the idealists who say, well, there's absolute truth, well, you, ask, you push back far enough with them, they say, well, I know it because basically I look, look within and that's how, how I've judged it, um, which means that they're basically judging it from themselves. So they're just as uh, subjective as people who are just saying, hey, I just practically do whatever works. So those are just some examples. I'd encourage you guys to um, look through these. Maybe we'll get to these at another time. Um, there's more stuff I'd like to look at with you guys, uh, but, uh, but we'll be out of time for tonight. Um, any just closing thoughts or things that you guys want to uh, add in or, or question or insights that you guys have? I'd be interested in your contribution. Does pragmatism go into any kind of just lifestyle habits? Or do you mean it strictly in a... Yeah, I mean, there's a pragmatism of like, okay, well, just, you know, you can just kind of slap together something that works. But as like a philosophy, it's more that whatever works equals what is true, and what is true is whatever works. Yeah, I guess thing. I'm thinking more, and it might go outside the bounds of pragmatism, but I'm thinking of the kind of the law of sowing and reaping, how the everyday can be broken down into most things are mechanical, with some exceptions. And if you can just maneuver in the mechanical, then you can achieve whatever standard you're looking for. But I don't know. I guess so. I mean, but sowing and reaping, yeah, I don't know if I call that pragmatism. It's, I mean, there are patterns that God's built the world off of, obviously, yeah. but... Yeah, but I, but that's not saying that they're that doesn't say say anything about ethics. That's just that could just be how it is. It does just yeah, because something so just because something works doesn't mean it's it's true or right. Is kind of what I was getting at. So. Um,
Okay. He eats. I think it's funny that you quote it more correctly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Round, that round table discussion. Yeah, Kenton is pointing out a quote from this atheist professor, former Page Mormon. Seven. Um, who was at this, uh, we, were, we were in Utah together, and we were joining together with this other church, and this guy, Mark, he was all up there about empiricism, about reason, he said, I hate the, you know, and he really did hate the God of the Bible, and, you know, he said, you know, God kills people, and this and that, and we're like, yeah, I kill sinners. Uh, <laughs> he said, we, we, you know, and so, anyway... But um, it was kind of like, I don't believe in God and I hate him type of thing. And it's, it is sad because it's like Mormons uh, often become, they don't usually just go to Christianity. They usually become atheists uh, because after Mormonism is destroyed, that's what their, their hope and truth was in. So once that's done, they're kind of like, well, now I don't believe in anything. But he was, it was funny because he was all about reason. He was all about empiricism. But then when I was, I was asking him some questions about, I'm like, well, you know, saying something about logic and arguing that, you know, the, the laws of logic would, would emphasize that, you know, I can make sense of that because God's the God of truth and he's the creator of this world and upholds it. But in your worldview, where would abstract laws of logic come from? And, uh, and I said, and, you know, laws, truth can't contradict each other. So he was all about logic, logic, logic till I brought that up. And then he goes... Well, logic can contradict itself, and I'm like, that's the in the definition. It cannot contradict. That's the point of logic. So, so it was the unbelieving thought on display of, well, I'll use logic and stuff as as far as it's convenient for me, but then I'll be willing to throw it away as soon as it's it's used in a way that if I were consistent, I would have to acknowledge the God of the Bible. Well, he did the same thing with ethics. He goes, you know, if the God of the Bible really does exist. I hope that there's some sort of cosmic police force that is going to bring him in for his crimes and bring him to justice at the end of time. And I said, wait a second, you mean like God? You want a God above God. So you just want an alternative God who's not the God that you hate, you know, to bring to bring justice. So he... That's a pretty illogical statement. Yeah, uh, <laughs> autonomous... Well, you contradict yourself. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Autonomous moral consciousness is not. Um, it's not consistent. You can't. Uh, you can't establish truth or ethics that way. Um, you. You. The only way you can have any truth or ethics is borrowing from the God of the Bible, who's the Creator. But in doing that, they they show that they their own guilt. So, anyway, we'll, we'll close in a word of prayer, and we will. Uh, we can discuss these things further or not. Uh, you know, but anyway, let's let's close in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that um, that even though we we do err, we do sin, we are corrupt. Um, Lord, that you can overcome that through uh, through the gospel that you sent Christ into the world to save sinners. Uh, that you made him your primary revelation, that you uh, presented the truth to us, and that you changed uh, our hearts to believe it through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that as we look at these things and the failure of unbelieving worldviews, that um, while it should instill confidence in us, Lord, that it should also uh, give us a, a humility of knowing that we did not uh, come to these conclusions because we uh, were in any way better than, uh, than any other uh, unbeliever, but Lord, just because of your your grace and goodness to us uh, in Christ and in redemption. So Lord, we thank you for these things. We pray that um, that as we study this stuff, it would not just be intellectual information, but that we would um, understand that in obeying you, we are attempting to uh, bring ourselves into conformity to Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just in time. <laughs>